Welcome to Let's Face the Facts, the rewatch podcast for the classic sitcom, The Facts of Life. Join us each week as we synopsize, analyze, criticize, and ultimately idolize the show. And now, here's your host of Let's Face the Facts, the wonderful David Almeida! Thank you, Matthew Arder. Welcome back. It's another week, another show. Thank you for downloading and pressing play. This week, Matthew and I welcome my friend, actress, singer, writer, entrepreneur, Katie Thayer. Now, a few random things before we actually get into the show. First, I need to give a shout out. I need to give a thank you to Shelly B, who sent a tip to the show. Thank you so much. We have had a few people over time sending tips to the show, which I I really, really appreciate it. Just nice little one time here, have a few bucks. And I really do appreciate it. It really does help defray the cost of hosting the show and upkeeping the website and blah, blah, blah. So those links are, of course, all in the show notes and the show's website, should you ever feel so inspired, like Shelly B. Thank you again, Shelly. Secondly, one of the uh, Patreon 2D Fruities, Jim S., sent me a YouTube ad for uh, the Where's Papa episode, which is a few weeks ago now. Uh, And it's the weirdest thing you ever saw because it does not resemble anything as far as what they say the show is about and the clips that are in it. It's really, really strange. You wonder if they just kind of said, set up a generic ad that could apply to any episode and we may just have to run it. Because, you know the whole stuff we were going through with the piano and the piano's there and the piano's gone and then it's back and now they're moving it in for the first time six weeks later. Uh, I was reminded, I think it was Jim uh, again who reminded me of this, that that year NBC was broadcasting the World Series. And I believe one of the episodes got bumped because the World Series game ran late. Well, remember, the networks do all the publicity way ahead of time. It's not like they could just push all the other episodes ahead. They had already submitted to your TV listings and all that for the next several weeks. So that's why you get an episode out of order every once in a while. And that does really stand to reason why this happened, because there really is no other Uh, narrative purpose to it. So thank you, Jim, for both that YouTube ad, which I will post on the webpage, and for that information. I really do appreciate it. Okay, back to this week's show. Katie Thayer joins me and Matthew in dissecting season eight, episode 15, called A Star is Torn, which had an original air date of January 31st of 1987. Are we ready to jump on in? Let's Face the Facts with Katie Thayer. So here she is, the beautiful, lovely, and talented Katie Thayer. Hello. (laughs) Hello, darling. So great to have you on the show. I am so excited to be here. Now, Matthew, you two have not met before. Katie Mm -hmm. and I work together at Sleuth's Dinner Theater, and uh, we have been ships that pass in the night at Fringe. We have both participated in Fringe festivals in Orlando, but not uh, together in the same show. But the two of you, uh, your paths have not crossed, have they? They have not. We have been trying to arrange this for some time, and it's like scheduling was never on our side. And thankfully now we, we got you and we can do this. And uh, wow, what, a, what an episode to, to get to have to discuss with us. Yay. It is. Um, as someone who watched a lot of Facts of Life when I was younger, um, Nick at Night, I don't remember this particular season. And uh, I, I don't remember this, uh, this arc. I think I, I had stopped watching by then. You and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Did you remember that uh, Cloris Leachman had taken over the role of the matriarch, as it were? No, I, I think I stopped watching when it was still Edna. So okay. I just, the first two minutes of the episode, I was like, when does Edna get here? When does, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, she's gone. She's been gone for weeks now. We're in season eight now, and season eight started with Mrs. Garrett marrying and leaving to go into the Peace Corps with her new husband. 
Oh, so, spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, well, it happened in the past. It was uh, 14 weeks ago now, or 13, actually. Uh, so, yeah, so we have no more Charlotte Ray. She was looking to uh, move on and do other things with her career and all that. So uh, I have a confession to make before we get started. I have lost my notes that I took on this episode. I don't know where I put them or maybe my computer crashed and they got lost. But uh, nonetheless, I did rewatch part of the episode and I am fully prepared to discuss it. It just may not be hours and hours. It may just be an hour or two. Yeah, now. I feel like that's what this episode deserves. Don't worry, Katie. He has the entire script in front of him to read to you. Oh, I do. So don't you worry. It's okay. So what we're going to be discussing here, and I'm literally flying by the seat of my pants, and by literally, I mean figuratively, uh, season eight, episode 15, called A Star is Torn. It was written by Martha Williamson, whom we have discussed before, directed by John Boab, whom we have discussed before. So no need to do any research there. Uh, this episode marks the second appearance of Stacey Q in the role of Cinnamon. And it also marks, Katie, I'm so sad to report, but glad that you're here for this, the final appearance of George Clooney on the show. He had been a regular the previous season. This season, he's only made sporadic uh, appearances. And now we, we, we don't have him anymore. And I'm sad. I do want to tell you how long it took me to realize that was George Clooney. How long? Uh, oh, well, because I was like, oh, his name is George. That feels familiar. No, who is that? John Stamos? No, that's <laughs> not. That's not John. Is that John Stamos? No. Oh, I know him. Who is it? And it wasn't <laughs> until the end of the episode where I went, I think that's George Clooney. Mm-hmm. Yep. I don't know if I want to walk into the ocean when somebody doesn't recognize George Clooney. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that thing of. Katie is younger than we are. I mean, than I am, Matthew. He looks exactly the same. The man doesn't age. His hair <gasps> looks significantly better. I am more likely to recognize someone by an iconic hairstyle than I am by their face. And that is John Stamos's hair. So it took me a long time for my brain to realize that was George Clooney and not John Stamos. Fair. I'll accept that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get to the point where Matthew and I like to put our guest on the spot, Katie Thayer. Okay. And we like to ask our guest to provide a one to two sentence brief synopsis of the entire episode, similar to what you might find in a TV guide. Go. Okay. Um, in this episode, we follow uh, Cinnamon, who is a friend of Tootie's that apparently appeared in another episode that I didn't know about because I stopped watching it when Edna left. And then you find out that you think she got fired from a Broadway show and then it turns out she's just like more famous and afraid of it. And her friends have to help her be more famous again. The end. Ding, ding, ding. Matthew, how do you rate? Very good. I mean, I don't know if I've ever read a TV guide thing that says this is after I stopped watching. But you know what? You know, (laughs) that was a parenthetical, I think. Uh, Well, if it makes you feel better, I never read a TV guide. Uh, Was TV guide ever a thing in your lifetime? Remember them? Vaguely. You you do? Okay. well, that's good. Uh, All right, then. Are we ready to do the maybe microscopic dissection, maybe not so microscopic since I don't have notes in front of me. This is going to be fascinating to see how this goes. So um, to sort of sum up the first scene, the first scene happens in the store. They are getting ready for a big sale. It is all hands on deck. And though Blair, Blair does show up late. We have many episodes, Katie, where we don't know who is running the store. But in this case, Everyone else is there, including George, who is returning to us, and Andy, the little one. Over the radio that they're listening to, the announcer says, this is Langley Radio, and up next, Joe Polnicek's going to be spinning the tunes. At which point, Joe jumps up from behind the counter and goes, oh, fucking shit, and runs out the door. I'm paraphrasing. No, that's what I remember. That's that's, the words I remember. Yeah, that was in the the, uh, network broad. That was in the Comedy Central version, I think. (laughs) 
So no sooner has Joe left than Cinnamon knocks at the door and they're like, Cinnamon, we haven't seen you since just a few weeks ago when we had that weird episode where Tootie was auditioning for a Broadway show and so were you. And she says, yeah, well, we learned that she got the show, but they're replacing her. And she says, that's fine. And she said, Tootie, you said to me I could stop by any time I was in the area. So here I am. So she befriends everybody. Introductions are made. And Cinnamon knocks on the door, David, and Blair doesn't even have to unlock it to let her in. Oh, did you? I didn't notice that. Like Blair just literally opens the door and it's like, well, that was a whole mess of you knocking. Okay. <laughs> but Joe's like, Joe's got, she, you work the overnight shift at the radio state. You, you just forgot. Well, and let's talk about this. Cause we do get more of the radio station and Joe as the episode progresses, but we had seen Joe in this radio station previously. It was a completely different layout that didn't make sense. This layout makes sense because there's actually a microphone at the soundboard so you can talk and spin the records. Before they had uh, the sound equipment in the left-hand room where all the performers were performing. And then the performance space was on the right. So Joe was having to flip switches in one room and then run into the other room over to the microphone and talk. And it's like, well, really? Really? So at least the set makes better sense. They redecorated and fixed that. But Joe was taking that as a course. It was a necessary thing, and she had to get a certain grade or she was going to flunk or lose her scholarship. That's the same story every time, it seems. But in this, it's like she's sort of there voluntarily, and there are other people flunking out of school and other DJs that she's covering for and doing 18-hour shifts there. And it's kind of like... uh she's a senior in college right now. She probably doesn't have time for a lot of electives. And this was never something that we perceived she did out of love for music and broadcasting. That's not what she gets into. So uh, already I'm, I'm wagging my finger and this is the beginning of the notes we're going to be sending to the writers back in the time machine, Katie. 18 hours on a shift. Cause that's the first time jump, right? Is She's been up, she's at the store. We don't really know what time it is when she's at the store, but I guess it's nighttime, it looks dark. And then you see her the next morning is 18 hours later. Yep. But it was nighttime before it was 18 hours. Yeah, and they're having breakfast, clearly, the next morning. But yeah, the announcer says, and that concludes 18 straight hours. Of... So, yeah. But, but 18 hours, I'm just saying, I don't understand what time the night before happens. If I breakfast agree. is 18 hours later. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're doing what I do, Katie, and you're <laughs> asking for logic and uh, simple common sense progressions of thought and space and time. And this being a 1980s sitcom. Set your GPS on whimsical. <laughs> I'm just saying the math doesn't add up on how long oh. she was at the radio station. It, I agree with you so, so much. By the way, Stacey Q is in a knit uh, top and bottom. It's like a light peach color and it's knit and it looks kind of bulky and like it's got heft to it. It looks a little cold weathery and yet it is a bare midriff top. It's a crop top and a mini skirt and there's actually a hole in the back. And you can see she's not wearing a bra. It's like this bizarre winter summer wear. And God bless her. I, is there any outfit she wears that doesn't show off her midriff? Can we take a moment while we're talking about that outfit to once that, um, what's the little weirdo's name? There's so many. Alf, Alfie? Andy? Alf, Andy, yeah. Alfie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, at least George Clooney was named George. You know, uh, yeah. but when he takes her coat, he has that creepy line, anything else? And it's like, do you? she's already not wearing clothes. First of all, that is not a line that I think would fly today on sitcoms, especially not having a literal child say it. Mm -hmm. Andy is the horniest 12-year-old on primetime television. <laughs> and we always get stuff like this from him where he's like, uh, hey, uh, you guys going to be gone for the night? I, maybe I'll call up a few stewardesses or something like he's always 
horny and doing stuff like that. And yeah, to say, can I take your coat (laughs) and anything else? It's like, dude, but Katie, this is the 1980s and there is a long, long standing tradition in this series of sexualizing minors. It started with the girls themselves in the early seasons when they were underage and wearing really, really skimpy clothing. And uh, now we've moved on to to the young males. It's let me translate that for the young lady, um, because I do speak child. Um, The first few seasons, um, my darling, were what what you might say cringe to watch (laughs) now. Do they say cringe cringe or do they say cringy? They say cringe. They say cringe. Yeah. Old oh. people say cringy. <laughs> Am I right? Am I right, Katie? Listen. I don't know. I'm old too now. So. It's us, it's us kids on this one. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Relative kids. Where does Tootie say? Because I missed I, I need somebody to explain a line to me that I didn't get. And I think it happened in the in the in the shop. Okay. Um, so she, somebody says, am I disturbing anything? And Natalie says, not unless we're standing on a fault line. Ah, yeah. I didn't get that joke at all. Like I didn't understand. Well, cinnamon asked that. And I yeah. think it's the idea that you are so hot and so attractive. The ground shakes between you. Like you could, you are so, you, you are the level of attractiveness that manipulates that time, earthquake? space and dimension. Yeah, I think, uh, okay. yeah, that's a, I don't, I, I agree with you. It's not the greatest line, but I, I get what the intent was. I did you get that, that Katie? Oh. No, it's funny because that happened. I was like, was yeah. that supposed to be a joke? Am I, uh, maybe it was just a, no, yeah, I didn't get it, it either. Awful. So Was it, or is it heat? Does heat cause a fault to open? Because the idea being, because you're, you look so hot and she's dressed so skimpily. What is this, the Big Bang Theory, for Christ's sake? <laughs> uh, I mean, volcanoes sometimes are on fault lines, but I feel like that that's a lot of a lot of gymnastics. The writer could have written a better joke there. Yeah, there's there's many other many other. So, uh, by the way, there is a little bit missing at the end of this scene that is cut from the syndicated version. Ooh. Yeah, George sort of she mentions that she likes one of the penguins and George is like, we got more in the store of <laughs> takes her off. And then we never see them again. And then there's a very quick, abrupt dissolve to the breakfast scene. But uh, the scene that's missing is where he bangs her in the storeroom. (laughs) That's the scene that's cut. That's what it is. It was the graphic sexual content that wasn't fit for network television. But anyway, it's more of them kind of recapping and talking about Cinnamon in the Broadway show and Tootie really emphasizing the, wow, they're replacing her in the show. She must be feeling so, so bad. We need to boost her self-esteem and blah, blah, blah. So uh, one question is, I don't know where is Cinnamon staying during all of this? Because the next morning, Cinnamon comes in with George and Andy. So she's not at the house, but it's morning time. They're having coffee. Where do you think she's staying? <laughs> well, if I were her, I'd have been staying at George's. No, no. I think I think she was staying there. It seems like it's a late breakfast. If Joe has really been on the radio for 18 hours, this feels... <laughs> It's this a feels brunch, like for Christ's sake. One of those like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, we've had our breakfast. Because like the, the people who are at the table are not still actively eating breakfast. So it's reasonable to assume that at like 8 a.m. she came out for breakfast and then the boy showed up to take her for a walk. Like she says she was just on a walk. That is reasonable to me because she goes upstairs to get her things at the end of the episode. Oh, you are totally right. When, when she and Tootie have their... Uh, their conflict. And, oh, I can't wait to get to that. I have a lot of thoughts on that when we get oh, there. Oh, we have thoughts. Uh, she does say, I'll go get my things. You're right. So I guess she is staying where? Who knows? Because we have the, the. I guess they have room to put her in a sleeping bag in Blair and Joe's room now that Tootie and Natalie are in their little separate bedroom. But that's a whole other series of crazy that we can't get you into here, Katie. Um, well, I do want to bounce back to the first scene real quick, only sure. because Blair says she's going to buy all those penguins so she doesn't have to label them. Yep. And then they just let her put a penguin on display and then they sell her, they sell Cinnamon a penguin. Like or they, they're trying to sell her a penguin. It's like Blair just said she was going to buy all of those. Are we just going to gloss over that? I know the joke <laughs> is that she has money, 
But like she did say she was going to buy all the penguins. I think she didn't mean that she was going to buy them. I think she was like, it would be easier and less work for me if I bought them. And also uh, typical of Tootie in the first scene. Like you've met this girl once. How did she know your address? We you didn't see you exchange once. your address. How the fuck did she know where you live to find? And you? Katie, and- not even that. I don't. I mean, maybe she looked you up in the in the white pages or something. I get it, but but Katie, you have to know with Tootie, she is balls deep or she is nowhere near. So it's uh, like immediately she's like, I can't let her throw away her career. <laughs> you met this bitch once. Like I went to high school for four years with people that signed my yearbook. And if they actually kept in touch, I would be like, what the fuck are you calling me for? <laughs> Not somebody I met once that sh- I'm, I don't give a fuck about your career. Are you cinnamon? For mm-hmm. God's sake. So what kind of just, friends are they? It's not like they've been exchanging letters. And she's a star on Broadway that has no one else to talk to about her career than some college girl in peak skill. Yeah. Come on, Cinnamon. You've met somebody in New York. Well, we do later find out she's hiding. Maybe that's part of the, the by design is where can I go that no one will ever suspect? Oh, this duty person. That that could be what made her choose the location. But yeah, I agree. You would think their reaction would be like, oh, hi. Yeah, I, I know I told you you could come visit me anytime. I, I thought we kind of mutually understood that I didn't really mean it. <laughs> but no, because Blair's the only one who's allowed to have the mean lines. And those are the only lines she has. Like, I remember early on in the season, she was that rich bitch that Joe kind of helped mediate out. And I remember her having an arc and being like nicer and the girls liking her. And this was like, oh, is this season one, Blair? Because she did not have one nice line in this entire episode. Yeah, it's not a very good Blair or Blair focused episode. That's for sure. It's kind of like when you watch an episode of the Golden Girls, like all you have to do, you could just drop in and find out, oh, Blanche is the slut because- And and oh, and she and Rose is the stupid one. The being this being the 80s writing that they're doing, there's no depth to these characters at all anymore. From the beginning, her showing up, oh, you're the one who embarrassed Tootie at an audition. Here's that backstory the audience needed, yeah. and we're gonna get out as meanly as possible. Sure, come on in. <laughs> Why is and Blair and Tootie her? never had an antagonistic relationship. If it was Joe, if it was that, then that would have been certainly something in terms of Blair always is ready to bust Joe's chops, but Blair get going, coming for 2d. That's not really a thing, but Oh, well. Um, So the next morning breakfast, like I said, they're all eating. Joe comes in. She's kind of a zombie uh, after the shift is drinking a lot of coffee. And then cinnamon George and Andy show up. They've been showing her the town and she thinks it's just charming. And then she's funny bit. I don't know if you noticed a funny bit. Andy follows Cinnamon in and tries to close the door on George. It was oh, I didn't away, see that. It was no. a thrown away bit, but it was hilarious. I laughed when I saw it. So Wait I will minute. say the positive spin on that. He does try to close the door on George. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I just saw it again. Somehow it is agreed upon that Cinnamon wants to stick around and help with the store. And she does have retail experience because her grandfather used to run a bait and tackle store up in where? Was it Wisconsin? Minnesota. Minnesota. I knew it was up there somewhere. And let's also give her some credit as well, because Cinnamon, I mean, she's Cinnamon, but she does nail her jokes here. Like when with her timing and everything, she goes, oh, what did you sell? Live bait. Like, yep. is she the best actress? No, but she she delivered what she was supposed to do. Yeah. So I, I wasn't as mad at her as I thought I was. I was fucking hair is ridiculous. But yeah, her whatever. hair. I mean, <laughs> what was that hairstyle? It's like, it when, like, you know, when you know, when you get like a Barbie doll and they have a style and then you accidentally take one of those Barbie brushes and just fuck it up. And then you like try to fix it. and You can't fix it. Yeah, that's what I felt like her hair was. 
that really <laughs> nails it actually because <laughs> it is like all shredded and teased and hanging like waterfall hanging pieces all around her head and framing her face but then the back is pulled tight uh with this very long and very straight ponytail and it's like what well, i mean you- the one thing you can say it was 87 so that was all her hair i oh, mean yeah. this was before extensions on white girls anyway yeah nope it's true so yeah, they're like, okay, sure. Help out in the store while you're here. Guess kind of licking your wounds. And so the next scene we have uh, Beverly Ann and Cinnamon, George and Andy in the store and uh, Cinnamon's ringing someone up and having a good time. Andy does the thing that I hate, makes an announcement to the room of three other people who, whom he knows. He says, attention shoppers, David. Yeah, there it is. Attention shoppers. No shoppers. Why no. would you just turn and say, ladies and gentlemen, or t- attention what did you say? shoppers. And then he's the only one that claps. Like Beverly Ann and George didn't even pretend to be like interested. Like It was like he didn't just say those words. And the funnier you know? way to do that would be, Hey, Cinnamon, that's great. You just made your first sale. <laughs> hey, guys, isn't she awesome? <laughs> Cinnamon, you're so awesome. Like that would have been the easy way for it to also be him trying to, you know, trying to schmooze her a little bit more. Yeah, that he would have been better have, writing. He might as well have just said, I just farted because the way they turned about their own scene was like he didn't even say anything mm-hmm. to that. Yeah. But so what, do- what did that guy buy? Because again, I was like, what does this shop sell? I don't understand the point of this. It's, shop. it's like a Spencer's Gifts. It's a it's a cute fun novelty things and decor and stationery and some records and we think the dildos might be behind the counter along okay. with the mustache rides t-shirts kind of a thing <laughs> all right all right so there is a brief exchange where uh it is alluded to that george says well it's great that you really enjoy doing this and she says well don't you enjoy working at your dad's hardware store and he says no i have to do that and she says well if you don't like it, you should do something else. You should follow your dreams. So that's touched upon. And then he's like, yeah, that would be nice. Well, I got to go. Bye. So but, then. But you did skip over my favorite line. Oh, please. Which was, ah, the thrill of retail. Oh, yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> that one did make me actually laugh. And I think it might be the only line this whole episode. Because she really sells it for not being mm. an actor. She really did. She, I, I believed her. I apologize because I don't have my notes. I believe the scene ends right around here, but something eliminated from syndication is an additional tag with Tootie coming in and talking to her about figuring out what you want to do. And this is where Cinnamon reveals explicitly, we can only infer this in the syndicated version, but Cinnamon says, I have decided what I want to do with my life, Tootie. I want to move here to Peekskill and I want to open my own bait and tackle store. Oh, that would be, yeah, that was not in that scene. That's great. That would have been helpful for the shit that follows, (laughs) wouldn't it have been? Mm -hmm. It's so weird what they decide to cut in all of these. But uh, we have, we also haven't discussed somehow they worked in the plot point that Tootie is going to be on Joe's radio show at the end of the week. One of, Joe's, bollocks. Ma- one make, of Joe's radio shows. Making her, yeah, one of her many night shifts. She's going to come in because uh, I, I don't know why, but it's some type of a talent reason. showcase. And, but they imply that it's like a full on event, like a theatrical yeah. event, a radio, like it's like fucking Orson Welles Mercury Theater shit. And Tootie wrote it and is directing it and is producing it. And then when we get there and she does it, it's like, oh, it's a 30 second monologue and a dude with a ukulele. Yeah, she calls it a dramatic reading that she's doing. (laughs) Is it? And like, I mean, I guess it's not (laughs) not a dramatic reading, but it's much more of a talent show once you get there. I forget which character says it's, I want to say it's like Blair or who else is there? Maybe Cloris Leachman says it, whatever her character's named. Beverly Ann. Yeah, sure. She's not Edna, so she doesn't count to me. 
<laughs> wow. Okay, we have a diehard Edna Garrett purist. And uh, not that I don't love Cloris Leachman, I just love the show more when Mrs. Garrett was on. I prefer the school. The Eastland years were the years that I really fell in love with. Next scene is at the radio station. Beverly Ann sweetly comes in and brings Joe some tea for no reason other than more screen time for Beverly Ann. That could have been something they cut instead. And then the guy that Joe was working with. And before, when we were at the station, the professor, Katie, who was in charge of the class and giving her the credit for doing this, he was a dick. This guy is a super nice guy. He's awesome. We like this guy. They're friendly. And uh, he comes up to her and hands her a new album. Or is it a CD? It's no, it's, a, it's actually a vinyl record album. And he says, oh, start putting this into the rotation. This just came in and this is going to be huge. And she says, really? Yeah. He says she just recorded the album. It's coming out and she's doing a U.S. tour. But big scandal going on. They can't find her. And he puts up the poster that came with it. And it's Cinnamon. Bum, bum, bum. And it's actually the cover of a Stacey Q album, but they changed the text to say cinnamon, color me cinnamon. And uh, so Joe sees it and realizes it's cinnamon. So that's the big dun, dun, dun. We go to commercial, big dramatic whatevers. Okay, but did you call it a CD a minute ago, though? It it was <laughs> well, no, later when George gives the, the karaoke track when she sings, George does hand her a CD. CDs did exist in the late 80s. It's just they weren't common. In 87? Weren't they? I thought he handed her a reel-to-reel, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, because I don't Maybe it was a cassette. A maybe, maybe it was a cassette. Maybe. Cassettes were in the 80s, because I didn't see a CD until I was like six or seven, and I wasn't born until 89. I'm going to go jump off the bridge. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying, CD. Well, maybe, maybe I get, you're probably right. You're probably right. And let me, I'll look at it again when we get there, that it's uh, it's probably a cassette, George. Anyhow, it was something little and plasticky and in my brain, uh, you're right. Uh, it probably is a little early. I'll bet you they existed. They just weren't ubiquitous. And certainly a freaking college radio station wasn't set up to be playing them yet in 1987. Katie, David still tapes his stories. So... <laughs> Well, apparently the CD was invented, according to Google, in 1979. There! Uh, Damn it! And- yes, I was right! <laughs> Fuck all of y'all! <laughs> it's first public release... Oh my God, I'm surrounded by two verifiers, for God's sake. <laughs> first public release was 1982. Uh, I guess I was just poor. Well, no, I remember in the late 80s listening to Dr. Demento. He would put out compilation records, and one time... There was this thing, and now brand new, even a Dr. Demento compact disc, which you can order by calling 1-800. So to me, compact discs were in the late 80s. It's just they were a novelty. They were just starting to permeate because I got my first CD late. Like it was like 92 or 93. That was late. Like everybody had them before I did. But I didn't. I don't know. The first CD I saw, again, I think was like 96 or 97. Oh, no, no. They definitely were out before that. That was, yeah. Well, again, maybe we were just poor. No. I don't know. <laughs> cassettes, cassettes had gone away by then, 96, 97. I think they were probably running neck and I neck. did not own my first CD, David, until the year 2000. <gasps> In the year 2000. Everything CDs. before that, we were buying cassette tapes. CDs took over um, Eclipsed Vinyl in 1988 and overtook the cassette in 1991. Okay, so definitely it was a tape. Okay. All right, then. So this is the commercial break, and we like to take a moment, Katie, and get to know our guest a little bit and talk about you and your career. My career? Well, it's no cinnamon. (laughs) (laughs) I first encountered the Katie Thayer experience acting with you at Sleuth's Mystery Dinner Theater, but would later uh, come to realize that you are also a a writer. 
you are also a singer, you are also an entrepreneur and a performance artist. And so uh, let me sort of start at the beginning. Where were you originally born? I was born in South Florida, but grew up in the St. Pete Clearwater area. Moved oh, okay. out to Orlando for college, where I got my BFA from UCF in theater, uh, minoring. A BFA from UCF? That's A-OK. Oh, so many acronyms. You're welcome. <laughs> so Excellent. Um, yeah. And what was started- your minor? Creative writing. Oh, well, that then it all is kind of tracking and stands to reason. So before that, before you came to Central Florida to study, a uh, question Matthew likes to ask everybody, what bitcha? Where did you first decide you wanted to be on the stage and perform and be an artist? Uh, well, so my mom had gotten her theater degree and my dad worked in radio. But then at this point, they were both teachers And then I was kind of deciding where to go to summer camp. And I hated outdoors, especially in summer in Florida. My mom was like, hey, there's a theater camp. And I went inside in air conditioning and attention. That sounds great. (laughs) And and it was. And I loved it. And that is what bit me. Oh, that's great. Air conditioning and attention. Well, work for a theme park and you will get one out of two of those. (laughs) Sometimes, but not always. <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> it's uh, it's really the goal, air conditioning and attention, double yeah. A. So that's cool. So uh, the other thing that uh, you are probably best known for to my tens of listeners, if any of them are local, uh, you are actually known to the Orlando Fringe Circuit as Bikini Katie, because that you really- came up with the brilliant idea of Everyone's trying to do marketing. Everyone's trying to do something different to promote their show, to be seen. And you said, hey, I'm going to sell space on my body where people can paint advertisements for their shows while I walk around in a bikini. You, you literally hired yourself out as a walking billboard. Uh, basically, bikini advertising space is a one woman bring your own venue performance art experience. The way I talk about it in my one woman show about body image and body paint is years ago, my very first fringe that I really participated in as an audience member was in 2010. And so I was sitting fringe poor in a Perkins with some friends, figuring out how I was going to pay rent after I spent too much money on shows. Mm -hmm. And so one friend was, you know, we were brainstorming and one friend kind of joked, you know, maybe you could sleep with artists, which would work out for her in the future. (laughs) And then I just joked. I don't know, I should walk around naked and sell ad space on my body. Wait, no, I should walk around in a bikini and sell ad space on my body. I could call it like bikini advertising space. And then after we laughed, I went, you know, that could work. And Uh history was made. (laughs) And uh, you did actually have to expand the business. Didn't you actually add models to add more body bikini space? Because it was at a premium. (laughs) Yeah. If we count the pandemic year when it was virtual and I did one episode of Bikini Gate Variety Hour, this is going to be the 10th year, I think, of it at Fringe. Wow. Uh, Yeah, next year will be the 10-year anniversary officially, I suppose, which just makes me feel old. But uh, (laughs) that year, Bikini Alex was with me. And then the next year, I had Bikini Hannah and Bikini Velvet. And then Bikini Hannah's been with me since then. Nice. Now, you mentioned it before, and I did want to bring this up. Let's talk about Beneath the Bikini. Ah, yes. So Beneath the Bikini is my one-woman cabaret. I like to say it's about body image and body paint. And it's my one-woman show about growing up not so skinny, loving food, and then finding the confidence to do that. Walk around in a bikini, selling ad space on my body. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's a really great show. I loved it. And you took it to New York, didn't you? Yeah. So I took it on a small tour. I went Ottawa, Kansas City, and New York. Uh, My last performance of Beneath the Bikini was mid-March 2020 in New York. Wow. Yeah. Got it in just under the wire. Barely. The state of emergency had been declared, but nothing had shut down yet. Uh, It was the weirdest time to be there because I had been there uh, two and a half weeks. So when I got there, it was and all of those memories are popping up on my Facebook now. But I full flew 
flu. Uh, a full flight with screaming children to LaGuardia. Uh, super expensive plane tickets to get there. Uh, stayed. It was super packed in the city the first week I was there. And then it was really packed the beginning of the second week. And then it was not so packed the next week. And then after the state of emergency was declared, it was a ghost town the last few days I was there. Wow. From leaving my friend's place in Brooklyn, getting into the lift to LaGuardia, getting to LaGuardia from the door through check-in, through checking my bag, through security to the gate was about 15 minutes. Man. Wow. And shows that you've written for The Fringe, I'm trying to think, Fifty Shades of Gay, uh, Ladies Room, the musical, which actually took place in a ladies room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the first one- What else have you written for Fringe? What else are the shows you've written? Um, and then the other things I've written for Fringe, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a, obviously, I've done the Bikini Katie Variety Hour, which is my outdoor stage show a few times. Yes, that's right. And uh, most recently, I did Two Mates in uh, 2021. Nice. Well, I am so happy I finally got you here. I have told you, you know, I'm a very big fan of yours. And some of the things you have done at Sleuths with roles that I had been working with for literally decades and actresses who have done perfectly wonderful work with and you have come in and made a completely different spin made it uniquely your own there's two in particular that come to mind one of which even inspired me a little bit to write the show that i wrote for sleuths which is loosely based on gray gardens because you were suddenly in there in another show doing a, a little edie impression talking like like little edie beale Mother wanted me to come out in Kimono. We had quite a fight. <laughs> and I was like, you're, you were in your mid-20s at the time. I'm like, child, do you know what you're even doing? And you were like, yeah, I'm doing Little Edie from Grey Gardens. And I was like, I'm going to cry right now that somebody under the age of 40 even knows what that is. So, uh, yes, I love when I get to work with you. And I am thrilled to have you on the show. And Katie Thayer, enough about you. We have got to get to the, well, here's the thing. The, the okay, we've gone to commercial. I, I want to say we have to get back to the conflict of this. We actually haven't gotten to the conflict yet. Right now, it's just this big question mark of, wait a minute, cinnamon is missing? Cinnamon's staying in my fucking bedroom. It's like, well, that's weird. But the scene coming up, Whoa, is a Lulu. Just this we would are... have been so different if cell phones had existed in 1987. Just saying. <laughs> so we're in the living room and everybody's home except for Joe. And then when Joe gets back, that's when it is revealed that Cinnamon is missing and actually has an album out and is supposed to be starting a tour. And when Tootie finds out, she is like, what? in the actual fucking fuck. Yeah. And Cinnamon, we learn, she's just getting cold feet. It's too much happening too fast. And she's dealing with a severe case of imposter syndrome. And so Tootie expresses her empathy by saying, you fucking selfish bitch. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but could we please talk about Tootie's reaction? I mean, like valid. <laughs> Oh, right? Really? Right? Yeah. I'm on Katie's side. Valid. Oh, no. The, Are you on Katie's side here? For, yeah. for every broken heart on Broadway, there's another light bulb. You just screw it right in, girl. I'm sorry. <laughs> Piss or get off the pot, bitch. Also, there are plenty of people waiting. Yeah. How very dare you, first of all. Thank you. Uh, I, didn't, on. I didn't see yes, this girl. previous episode where she immerses her at this call. But this bitch had this role on Broadway that Tootie really wanted that she didn't get. She comes to visit her when she runs away from it because she's going to hide out with the failure because no one's going to look for her there. And then she, when you find out about it, yeah, of course, Tootie's going to go off. What a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> and Tootie, Tootie going, here I am doing a fucking college radio show, hoping somebody fucking hears it. Knowing that ain't nobody gonna just for a fucking shot. Yeah. Take several seats, Cinny. 
But like, <laughs> let's go beyond this, right? Because it's also 1987. And if we were to look at this exact dynamic from a modern eye, here you have an attractive white skinny girl who's been given all of these opportunities who says, oh, what was me? My life is too hard. And here you got this strong independent black woman who is trying so hard and keeps getting knocked down and accepting substandard from what this other girl has, just trying to get a little bit of what she has. Yeah. I would be pissed too. Yep. I have in big block letters, white privilege much. Oh, however, I will tell you this, Katie, the one flaw in, in your view of this is, um, Tootie is a terrible actress. So (laughs) she would have never have gotten this opportunity (laughs) anyway. You have an audition for Broadway and I'm also watching, uh, cinnamon's acting skills and I am less than impressed. No, I don't mean Kim Fields is a terrible actress. I mean, like the character of right. Tootie. I'm Anytime sure. Tootie does a show, she gets terrible reviews. It's almost a running gag that they don't realize is a running gag where we are like, you know, overall as a whole, we're like, is, is Tootie a terrible actress? We know in her future, she ends up not going into acting. We know that she ends up a successful talk show host, like a, you know, Oprah kind of a thing. So she ends up, it's like the acting thing kind of doesn't really work out for her, interestingly. Whatever, she's had an audition for Broadway. So in the universe of this show, she's good enough. Well, a professor saw her in a class and asked her to attend. So maybe, or maybe he just caught her on a good day. I'm still team Katie. I'm still team Katie when it comes to this. (laughs) And I'm glad you said it. So I didn't have to. I am floored because the episode is so clearly set up for Tootie to be in the wrong. And uh, it's, God. The that ending is made so me actually funny. angry, just so we're aware. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then let's start careening toward Wait, the ending. Wait, but I do want to pause. Can we talk about the worms? Oh, that's right. We have <laughs> worms. And we don't know why the fuck we have worms if we haven't seen the full length version on the DVDs that tell us the worms are there because she's planning to open this tackle store. But I, the only redeeming moment for Blair this whole episode is when she takes these little worm babies under her under her proverbial wings. Worm wings? I don't know what, what yeah, do worms sure. have. They don't even have appendages. No, they don't. But yeah, and she what does she name them? She names them like Rockefeller and Vanderbilt or something. Something it's like, like that, yeah. She names them after rich people. And it's like later when they talk about it, well, you got to get home to the worm. She's like, no, it's okay. I left the TV on for them. Yeah, that's the best line she has the whole episode. Yeah. Oh, and George comes in looking for Cinnamon and Cinnamon's already left. She's like, okay, I'll, I'll leave. If you feel this angry, this much anger towards me, I'll get the fuck out of Which here. like, good, she should. Fuck her. Okay, even if they were friends, which they're not, just so we're clear, because friends are in touch with friends, friends keep in contact with friends, and friends don't lie to friends. She lied to her about why she was there so that she could take advantage of her kindness. That is unfair, and she deserved to be yelled at. Get the fuck out. This is awesome, because I did not expect this. Wow. Avid, to- I bought myself an Emmy for Christ's sake. <laughs> you thought I'd side with cinnamon on this? Okay. Mm-mm. Well, just in no. terms of hating that, you know, when Tootie goes over the top, Tootie can be a little fucking bitch. She was way nicer than she could have been. And she was way nicer than I would have been. Ah! <laughs> How I'm loving this. How is she not going to tell her? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? Oh, I didn't want to tell you. That's not how friendship works. Wow. Uh, Going back to the worms later (laughs) after Cinnamon has left, George comes in. He's like, hey, I'm here for Cinnamon. They're like, she left. He's like, we were supposed to go fishing. And Blair covers the shoebox and says, please, George, not in front of the (laughs) W-O-R-M-S. That was kind of cute. At least it gave Blair something to do because Blair and Natalie just don't really have a lot going on. It's not really about them this week. Which is a shame because Natalie is my favorite character in the show. I love Natalie too. Well, she's perfect and brilliant and sassy and usually has the best jokes in the show, which is why I was so mad with that fault line thing at the beginning because it's like, uh, what's happening? You're the funny one. Yeah, you could do so much better than that. Yeah. Yeah. 
so uh Tootie comes down for this is i guess another day another breakfast and she's like i know you think i was hard on her but blah 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 i'm going off to do my thing and they're like oh yeah tonight's your big night <laughs> by the way she's like yep tonight at seven uh when she does the performance she does it then the ukulele guy goes for like a minute and a half yeah. and they're like okay well this is the station signing off it's like you, you sign off at 7 10 in the evening is that no it's mm-hmm. so bad it's so bad and so dumb and then the hours and numbers don't add up because joe has been on until three in the morning before so unless this is like a sunday but we know it's not because it's a friday they're just gonna leave Friday night, prime time music. I assume people used to listen to the radio on Friday nights because you didn't yeah, have and college radio. That was the time to hear the awesome music that wasn't being filtered by the corporations and the big stations and the sponsors and all that. So college radio was like the best and it still is. It's the best radio to listen to. The other thing, this relates to a trope that I absolutely, I don't say I, I hate it, but it is a trope that amuses me is the whole thing of you spend the entire half an hour of an episode leading up to a performance, a talent show, a something. And so you'll have 20 minutes of lead up and then the the big show, it's time for the big show and it's five minutes long. I wish we had five minutes. David, I wish we got five minutes. (laughs) We didn't. So first of all, Trudy goes up to do it. Uh, and I'm already mad because her friends aren't there, right? And it's going to be this. Yeah. The whole idea is she's been a bad friend to Cinnamon. So her friends aren't going to come here and to support her because she's wrong, which is wronger. That's right. It is more <laughs> wrong than her having an emotional reaction. If they were really her friends, they would have been like, hey, that felt a little harsh. Let's talk about it. We're still going to be there to support you, but we should talk about it. And of course, her, but also like, this is her big thing. They weren't going to get there early. They weren't going to listen to the whole thing. They heard roughly half of that minute long thing. That was like not bad, first of all. They yeah. Heard half of it. And then most of a ukulele guy they didn't pay attention to. I want to say they just got caught in traffic, but because they happened to get caught in traffic, Tootie's like, well, guess my friends aren't here. And she says to Joe and Joe's like, nope, I guess not. And again, uh, I know one of them would have texted, but texting hasn't been invented yet. So um yeah it is it is bad that they're not there but i'm not sure that that was so much a statement as i, I don't know what the fuck they didn't was. get caught they in were... traffic if it was important to them they would have been there early do you show up to a friend's performance at the performance time no you are there 15 minutes early to make sure that nothing happens and you are there to support them especially when they are only the first minute of a thing <laughs> 30 seconds even are you kidding me This monologue that she wrote and produced and directed and performed, it's a 30 second monologue basically saying, you can't play me like a player piano or like I wanted a a bass and like some beatnik uh, snare, what do you call the drums with the with the brushes on it? Like it felt like beat poetry, didn't it? Yeah. Well, it was like a fine spoken word. I rather liked it. I thought she did a fine job of it. And then it was just done. And we had the Israeli exchange student with his down-home ukulele, I think, were the words they used. Uh, yeah, very weird. Matthew, you were going to say something and I cut you off. I'm sorry. Well, it didn't help that they spend the 20 minutes of the show building this up like she's being broadcast during the goddamn Super Bowl, for God's sake. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, you would think that this hit was going to be the War of the Worlds. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, it's a 30 second monologue. It's like, whoa, gee. Confused because, like, she put together this whole talent show or she put together just that piece because she said she performed, directed, produced. Yeah. Oh, I'm confused because uh, it's announced at the beginning that it's national college radio, but it's being broadcast. So it's like, oh, uh, we need to do something to make it seem important. So is there, is there like a national, co- like, is there an NCR, like the way there's a national public radio where a local affiliate might get a chance to, broadcast national yeah let's just throw that in the script i don't know if that really exists but it's only the two from their college like yeah but again and it's and it's a barely five minute excerpt at seven o'clock on a friday night it's like 
Then what? they sign off. They couldn't even get three. We can't even do the rule of three to have three acts. I, I, I don't know. And can we talk but, about the ukulele play? Please do. It was bad. The, I what, couldn't what, hear it. It was so in the background. I really wasn't paying much attention to it. Was it not good ukulele play? Literally, all he's doing is like strumming quickly. I couldn't hear a lot of chord progression. It sounded like I brought this as a visual aid. Uh, oh, it look like who has just, her ukulele handy. How convenient. You know, just in case there was a talent show for a college radio. But it sounds like he's just Just like in this. case someone's listening. This is your one shot. He's literally just what, doing this. What is it? Do it again. I can't hear it. So, yeah, it was like two strong. chords. It's like two or three chords and he's just strumming very quickly. And so they're just, his hand is cramping. It has been a minute. Can I know they're acting like a musician is not capable of playing more than three minutes at a time. What's what like, what is kind that about? Of endurance that you do a talent show and you're not prepared to play the ukulele for a full minute. Hmm. I mean, if they're anything like the ukulele players, I know they will hog the stage for a fucking hour. If you let them, you know, you don't hmm. say. <laughs> <laughs> oh no she picked it up again <laughs> so then uh after the girls show up cinnamon and george show up as well i well, forget where he found her well this is before the ukulele player and after she makes him stay back at this talent show and does an apology for a friend that's right that's right i'm sorry i forgot god the other trope wait a minute before we go off the air there's something i have to say I was really, really judgmental of a friend. And well, if I could speak to her now, I would tell her how sorry I am. And oh my God, she's just walked in the studio and is overhearing it. Yeah. Oh, what are such you doing here? Rope. Joe has to save it, has to save the radio station again because no one is competent except for her. And then yep, he's so true. Play some very fast ukulele while they have their their moment. This uh, I'm still so mad at cinnamon i cannot stand <laughs> it i cannot stand well it. well then to cap off the talent show because they do have a couple more minutes left tootie says cinnamon will you please sing for us and she's like well okay i'm looking right now to see what george hands, hands but it just out. he's carrying nothing else except her background music conveniently she has a pre-recorded karaoke track of yeah. a song from her new album. And Joe does take the opportunity. And this is good where she says, this is a lady you're going to be hearing a lot from in the future, but don't forget you heard it here first. This is Cinnamon. Yeah, because Joe and is the only competent person in this entire series. <laughs> True. Well, Blair is competent at watching worms. <laughs> my uh, and my so opinion stands. <laughs> And so Cinnamon goes into the studio and lip syncs, I mean, sings uh, <laughs> the Stacy Q hit song called, what is it? We Connect. Is that what it's called? I believe it. I thought it was called Two of Hearts again. No, <laughs> it does sound an awful <laughs> lot sounds like lot Two of Hearts, like two doesn't of it? Hearts. I didn't even but know. Yeah. I didn't even realize it. I was like, this sounds familiar. No, it definitely Wait sounds like second. Two of Hearts. Yeah, We Connect. Two of hearts. <laughs> da, 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 da. Anyway, so then she sings, and that's what we get at the very end. It's just her standing in the microphone, performing, <laughs> realizing she is the bare midriff. And Tootie's standing right next to her, looking on so happily. Oh, I'm I'm nice now. My friend has forgiven me, and we're we're friends again. Yeah, and what's and Cinnamon ever gonna do for Tootie? Nothing, because she doesn't yeah. have to. <laughs> she steals she steals her role on broadway she comes to her town she steps on her big night and makes it her platform and then she just fucks off into the night with her record contract do you think she's going to tell any of them like hey i have this friend tootie who's really trying to get a leg up no she's not you got <laughs> george to quit his hardware store job and she robbed us of more george clooney who looks like john stamos cinnamon is the worst wow yeah Poor little white girl. She's got to choose between a starring role on Broadway or a national tour promoting her own record album. Oh, yeah. With George She's Clooney. Yeah, as with one George of your Clooney. 
Fuck yeah. off, cinnamon. <laughs> and one thing is interesting that uh, when George came in earlier to say, well, where's cinnamon? We were going to go fishing. And they're like, she's gone. And he's like, gone? He goes, I just quit my job because of what she said in the last scene. She inspired me so to follow my dreams. They're like, well, then well, you quit your job at your dad's hardware store. What are you going to do? And he's like, I don't know. I guess maybe I'll hit the road or something. Well, then with this, he comes in and says, I am going to hit the road. Cinnamon says I can go on her tour and be a roadie, among other things. They're definitely uh, fucking. But how interesting to give George Clooney a send off like this for he was on the show most of the episodes last season. But this season, it's been very sporadic. It's interesting that they even made the choice to give him an actual reason for leaving as opposed to just having him be there. And then he's not there. Do and we, we kn- don't give a shit. Do we know we're maybe Stacy Q and George Clooney dating? Um, I hope so for her sake. <laughs> dating is a strong word. I think back then George was kind of fucking his way through Hollywood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, Sure. Dating. Yeah, that's what we'll call it. We'll go with that. I I hope they hooked up. I'm not sure that they ever formally dated. um, But but who knows? I that's something I did not look up. Uh, Listeners, do you know, did George Clooney and Stacey Q ever date formally? That would be a proof of this. Send me a link. A cute send off appearing on his girlfriend's episode and then being like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to run off with her. Yeah. And it's going to be a few years before he starts ER. But, you know. He'll still work. He'll do fine. A handsome white man in Hollywood doing fine. And B. And then the last thing that happens is it's like, oh, well, isn't this great? And George says, come on, I'm going to spring for pizza for all of us. Okay. They all grab their coats and out they go. And Joe stays behind with the guy that she's working with. The It's like, bitch has given you 18 hours straight. Why? You just signed off. There's no more radio. She can't go out for fucking pizza with her friends. That infuriated me. Yeah, because she's the poor girl, so she has to stay because she's the scholarship kid and she's often ostracized, especially in episodes like this. I don't know. I I got real angry for a lot of reasons in this episode, but how they treat (laughs) Joe is one of them consistently. Wow. All right, my dear. Who's watching the store? Oh my God, so true, so true, Katie. And then, what did she do after this facts of life episode, David? Tell us, tell us what happened to Stacy Q. All not quite the same thing as Tiffany, <laughs> but kind of the same thing as Tiffany. Like you might find her on an '80s cruise. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Bless and- her heart. Yeah, bless her heart. She was kind of a one hit wonder, but I think she still continued to record and she still continues to perform. And uh, it might have taken a while for it to come back around again to do the nostalgia circuit. Well, Katie, this has been fun. And uh, I think we're going to end with uh, with a final moment of of self-revelation, if you are willing. Have you ever suffered from imposter syndrome? Probably. 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 Yeah. Not that I can think, not that I can think of at this exact moment, but like almost definitely at some point in my life, Uh theater school. Yeah. So I have it all the time, all the time. I have to stop and say, dude, you're here and you didn't get here for nothing. You know, it's like, it's, but uh, Matthew, do you ever uh, have imposter syndrome? No. I find that hard to believe. (laughs) Not you, you're an imposter. (laughs) It's part of my daily life. (laughs) Yeah. Having people find out that I'm a hack. Having people find out that I, yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. That I'm not, I I didn't go to school for this shit. And I'm in a room full of people that could be fucking groundlings Mm -hmm. because of their level of understanding of improv. And I'm like, oh, I'm just, I just say funny things sometimes. I don't know what this improv thing is. Sometimes that's all you need. But uh, also justice for Tootie and uh, fuck cinnamon. (laughs) 
That's the final thought. Better parting words I could not have asked for from you, my darling. So thank you, Katie. It's been great having you on the show. Smooches and goodbye. Right. Love you. And there you have it. That was Katie Thayer. What an unexpected, spirited discussion regarding Team 2D versus Team Cinnamon. I, 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 you could say they kind of ganged up on me, but I was just thrilled because it was such a surprise and an unexpected twist. And God knows that doesn't happen. Usually you can pretty much expect that, you know, we're going to be snarky and we're going to hate on 2D whenever she's acting like a little bitch. But no, not at all. What a surprise. I guess, I guess it's different when you start talking about this stuff with actual actors actually in the business, huh? <laughs> anyway, next week we're going to be watching Season 8, Episode 16, called A Winter's Tale. And our guest is going to be musical theater virtuoso Kevin Kelly. You can watch the show ahead of time for free at dailymotion.com, and I will post the link in the show notes and on this episode's webpage. That is all for now. Thank you so much for listening to this week's show, and remember... The facts of life are all about you. Let's Face the Facts was created, produced, written, hosted, and edited by the wonderful David Almeida. Our theme song was beautifully arranged and recorded by Ned Wilkinson. Please visit facethefactspod.com for supplemental photos and videos links to social media, and ways that you can support the show. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This is Matthew Arder saying tune in again next week for another thrilling episode of Let's Face the Facts.